With that, I'd like to introduce our last speaker and last performer, I should say. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for a wonderful illusionist from the DFW area that's also performed at Vegas regularly. Uh, he is going to have a spellbinding performance that we've been lucky to see in the past. It's excellent, it's, very, it's wonderful to watch. So please join me in welcoming Trig Watson to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I love performing magic. However, I've noticed that whenever I perform magic or perform a magic show, that my audience tends to divide itself into two distinct categories of people. There are those that enjoy giving in to the moments of suspended reality and, and don't want to know how the tricks are accomplished. And then there's that other special group of people that when watching the, the magic performed, they simply view as puzzles to be solved. But today I'd like to do something a little bit different. Instead of looking at magic as a puzzle to be solved, I'd like to instead solve a puzzle using magic. And for thousands of years, mankind has been asking countless puzzling questions. And you guys know the questions I'm talking about. Questions like, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Or, uh, what was the best thing before sliced bread? Right. <laughs> Uh, what's another word for thesaurus? <laughs> and is it true that cannibals don't eat clowns because they taste funny? But of all these questions, there rises one, which rises far above the rest, and that, my friends, is this. Which came first? The chicken. or the egg. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's a plastic egg, but I'm using this to make a point, all right? Why, why is it that we spend so much controversy? Why do we argue so much about what is essentially a feathered farm animal? I mean, think about it. Fish, fish lay eggs, right? So do snakes. I mean, couldn't we equally ask which came first, the egg or the emu? Or if you're Australian, which came first, the kangaroo or its pouch? But I digress. I'd like to look at this controversy through the eyes of three main people groups. Evolutionists, creationists, and librarians. Now, the evolutionists would point out that it was not the chicken, but instead the egg to come first, because we all know that from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective, in order for an animal to adapt or change into a chicken, the change must first take place within the embryo or egg. Now, if you're a creationist, if you're perhaps a little bit more biblical, you would probably disagree. You would argue that it was not the egg, but instead the chicken to come first, because we all know that biblically speaking, in the first seven days of creation, God did not go around laying a bunch of eggs. You know, he said to the animals, be fruitful and multiply, not be fruitful and hatch. Now, the librarian would agree with the creationist, but for a completely different reason. You see, the librarian would point out that, alphabetically speaking, the word chicken comes before the word egg in the dictionary. Unless, of course, you're a Spanish librarian in which case the word for egg, huevo, comes before the Spanish word for chicken, pollo. So the, the Spanish librarians, they'd have to side with the evolutionists. But this, look, look, this is not to say that you cannot have Spanish creationist librarians or, or English evolutionist librarians. I mean, plenty of my closest friends are Spanish creationist li Never mind. The, the issue here is that the problem is circular. You know, the, uh, the chicken lays the egg, or the egg hatches the chicken, but then also the... <laughs> the chicken lays the egg. So if we have any hope of solving this mystery, we must simply remove an element from the equation. And to do so, that, and to do so we'll have to use just a little bit of magic. I'll simply remove the hole off of the egg, thereby removing the chicken from the analogy. For 
an egg without a chicken is just that. An egg. <laughs> now, I realize I haven't exactly solved the puzzling question at all. You know, when you think about it, though, in my opinion, sometimes the, uh, the answer is a whole lot less interesting than the question itself. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I love using magic to convey kind of sometimes preposterous ideas, but at its core, my job as a magician is to simply break the rules of logic. You know, it's my job to create experiences that tear away at our understanding of what can or cannot be done. I love the fact that the exact same senses of sight and sound that are telling you that I am ripping up this newspaper can also be, at the exact same time, just a few seconds later, can be the exact same sensors that are telling you <laughs> that I'm not. <laughs> and it's in these moments that we get to generate mystery. And as a magician, it's one of these moments that, of course, I live for. Now, obviously, I'm not really doing these impossible things. <laughs> I'm just giving off that impression. <laughs> through a combination, I'm giving off that impression through a combination of sleight of hand, <laughs> psychology, and lies. <laughs> So why on earth would I dedicate so much time to doing what is essentially just deceiving people? Well, I believe this. These lies can also illustrate a greater truth. That no matter how much we learn about the world, how smart we become, how much knowledge we gain, there are always going to be little things that lie completely beyond our comprehension. And I realize that's a pretty lofty purpose for something as simple as a rope trick. But I absolutely believe it's true. And magicians have been trying to create these moments for their audiences for centuries. And I thought it might be appropriate to go through a few minutes of just a high-level history of Western magic. The earliest records we have of magicians are these tribal shamans. They would use what were essentially conjuring tricks to create a sense of power among their tribe to show and demonstrate their connection to the spiritual, uh, spiritual world and the gods. We, uh, we have records of Greek and medieval street performers, uh, these street magicians who would perform a trick with these balls that would appear and disappear underneath different cups and often uh, con people out of their money, all the townspeople as they were watching. Later on, we saw magic uh, evolve into more of a theatrical experience, an evening's entertainment. And the gentleman to the left there, you see, or yeah, your left there is uh, Robert Houdin, who is known as the father of modern magic. He was the one who took magic off of the streets and put it in a theater. He ditched the robes that many magicians wore and instead dones, you know, uh, gentlemen's evening wear, uh, coat tails and top hat, which was a standard sort of high society uh, garment, you know, uh, wardrobe at the time. His look was so impactful and had such an impact on sort of modernizing magic that it was copied. And, and even if you ask people today, I'm sure if you think of a stereotypical magician, bizarrely, even though fashion has moved far along, we still think of a magician as the gentleman in the top hat and, or pulling rabbit out of a hat in coat, hat, and tails, right? Um, which is really interesting. Next, we, uh, we saw the evolution of vaudeville, you know, the, the American vaudeville circuit, in which many magicians would actually make their livelihood, make their careers just traveling with a single 10-minute act. They would travel around from theater to theater, and one of the most famous vaudevillian uh, entertainers at the time was, of course, Harry Houdini. He was one of the greatest, a famous magician and escape artist. Interestingly enough, Houdini, as paying homage to one of his heroes, took the name Houdini from the father of modern magic, Robert Houdin. A little fun fact there for you guys. 
Then we saw magic suddenly start to combine with Las Vegas spectacle. You know, we, uh, we, we had these huge shows. Magic got bigger and, and more grand. We had, you know, Las Vegas, spectac Las Vegas spectacle combined with wild animals and Siegfried and Roy were one of the, ma the most famous sort of uh, big magic acts in Vegas. As TV became more and more, you know, significant and part of people's lives, we saw these, these sort of illusionist celebrities uh, that uh, really made a name for themselves having big national television specials. You see Doug Henning on the left there and David Copperfield from the, the 80s and 90s. David Copperfield would travel and sell out concert arenas with his mega magic and large scale illusions and sort of had this rock star image. Even though they also had television specials, television was a little bit different. And television as a, as a frame, as a, as a medium for magic has really impacted the art itself. We have more modern magicians like David Blaine and Chris Angel, who you may have seen their, their episodes on TV, in which they uh, really had a totally different approach to the way magic should be shown on TV. You know, in the reality TV show age, we really earn or yearn for more, uh, more reality, more, authentic, uh, more authenticity in, in what we're watching. And, and these guys had the idea to take magic off of the stage and put it into an everyday life situation, put it onto the streets and accompany, have a, a camera crew accompany them and they would be able to basically stage these magic moments in real life with, for real people. And if you watch these episodes closely, you'll actually notice that a whole lot more time is put towards the, uh, the, the reactions to the magic tricks themselves, uh, uh, the reactions as opposed to the magic tricks themselves. About two thirds of airtime is just people screaming and running away and you know, reacting in these very real ways. Uh, but I think that really connects with just the way, the way our media is going. We really need more proof, you know, in, in our own living room and we're watching TV, that what we're seeing on screen is exactly what you would see had you been there live. So now we're in the YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Google generation in which everything is instantly downloadable, everything is instantly shared. And some magicians have actually made quite a career out of themselves just basically creating content for YouTube. Of course, YouTube itself has a whole lot of challenges and, and pluses, the pluses being that you can share content instantly with millions of people. But it's also difficult, especially for the art of magic, because everything is, uh, it's a little bit harder maybe to prove that what you're doing live could really be done in real life, but it's, it's also difficult to prove to people that, uh, you know, you're, it's difficult to prove that, that you're not using trick cameras or something like that. So you have to take some extra, extra effort into proving that what you're doing live is real. Um, another interesting aspect of this is that uh, people can Google anything at this point. You know, secrets are not exactly secret anymore. You know, I, I, when I was growing up and learning how to be, you know, how to be a good magician, reading all these magic books from the library, I was always told, you know, the magician never reveals his secret. It's not really my responsibility anymore. At this point, it's almost the, the, the responsibility of knowing or not knowing, the responsibility of deciding to live in the mystery or deciding to Google it <laughs> is, is the audience's responsibility itself, which I think is really interesting. Uh, some other issues here is that, you know, not only apart from the Googleability aspect, but also just, you know, in my opinion, I think we've gotten to the point where, where magic is, uh, oh, hold on, let's go to the next slide here. Oh. Yeah, so where are we going next? You know, the, the, the trends are such that we've got new technology coming out. You know, we may have the ability to Google something in our heads as we're watching a magic show, you know, real time. These are the things that I think about as a, you know, a, young, a young performer of magic. You know, what is my show going to be like? 20 years from now, you know, what technology is going to be, uh, am I going to be using, but it was what, my, what are my audiences going to use to, to translate that experience into their own homes or, you know, as they're watching a show. Uh, I think in this modern world, we're getting more and more in some ways desensitized to the experience of magic. You know, in this modern world, we get to watch impossible things happen all the time. I mean, if you, if you turn on the television, you can see objects, uh, products transform into company logos. You can see people fly around in video games. You know, we can, we can do anything. And I think in some ways it gets easy to, to just sort of get distanced from the impossibility that you're truly watching. I mean, take even, you know, take this uh, iPad, for example. I mean, when you think about it, think how magical this device really is. I mean, you can access the world's information. You can make videos and photos instantly. That's why the performance of Magic Live is always going to be so much stronger <laughs> because it's happening in real life, in real time. Of course, this also makes it just a little bit more challenging. 
though also has the possibility of just being a little bit more impressive. though not impossible. <laughs> so I'd like to propose a toast to impossibility. Thank you.